Back in the 1920s, Babe Ruth was the most photographed man on the planet, transcending the world of sports to become a cultural icon. His larger-than-life personality, charisma, and off-field antics, combined with his appearances in advertisements, film acting, and vaudeville, made him absolutely ubiquitous and impossible to avoid. But in 1925, Babe Ruth was also deeply and mysteriously unwell. He, accompanied by several teammates who were concerned with his escalating drinking, suddenly slipped out of the limelight and went on a mysterious trip to the Maritimes. You're listening to Backyard History, the hidden stories that happen in your own backyard. The podcast version of the weekly history column running in newspapers across the Maritimes with your host and author, Andrew McLean. Sports writer Glenn Stout wrote in his book Yankee Century that Babe Ruth's legend is still one of the most sheltered in sports. Even today, 99 years after that low point of both Babe Ruth's career and his personal life, his former baseball team, the New York Yankees, still refuses to talk about those mysterious events in 1925. One year earlier, the 29-year-old Babe Ruth had not only won the league's batting title, but had led his team to its fourth consecutive pennant, a feat which at that time had never been achieved before. However, by the following spring, he was in an appalling state. While Babe Ruth never quite looked like an athlete at the best times, with his large upper body and thin wrists and thin legs that the New Yorker described as looking like toothpicks attached to a piano. By then, his weight had ballooned up to an alarming 260 pounds. He was playing poorly on the field, having the worst season of his career so far. He managed only 25 home runs compared to 46 the year before. Often, he didn't even play at all, only appearing in 98 games that year compared to 153 the year before. Worse though, he was falling apart off the field. Normally he was affable and friendly, but suddenly he'd abruptly become mean and violent. He kept getting into fights. He kept getting suspended by his own team. It was not particularly clear even today, where he was disappearing to when he was missing games. And his team remains tight-lipped about it even now. However, sports writer Glenn Stout claimed that he was being repeatedly hospitalized in New York's St. Vincent Hospital at this time. Whatever was going on with him was definitely putting Babe Ruth's health in severe jeopardy. He collapsed during spring training, leading British newspapers to prematurely print his obituary. He was later found unconscious in a bathroom in New York, requiring hospitalization. When he went to the hospital then, he had a seizure. With his team trying to cover up that something was wrong with their superstar, even the ravenous press of the day was unable to get the full picture of how bad things were with him. When Babe Ruth next collapsed on the field during a game, the mystery around what was wrong with him led sports writer W.O. McGeehan to joke that he was sick from eating 25 hot dogs in one sitting before a game. While this was a joke, not everyone got it, and it was republished as actual news around the world, causing Babe Ruth to become a laughingstock. His genuinely severe and worsening health problems were being called. The belly ache heard round the world. What exactly was actually happening with the world's biggest star in 1925 is still hotly debated even today. Even now, the New York Yankees remain tight-lipped about the true story. However, it's been widely suggested by many writers, including Glenn Stout, that during this time, Babe Ruth was actually secretly battling a crippling drug and or alcohol addiction. And it certainly was crippling to Babe Ruth's career. On September 1st, the Moncton Transcript published an astonishing quote from Edward Burrow, manager of the New York Yankees. Find us a customer, somebody who will take Ruth's contract and his upkeep, his overhead, in gray hairs, care, 
toll and trouble, and we might talk business. Can you think of any owner who would want to undertake such a job? The Yankees were seriously considering firing their star player. Within a week of that article, the same newspaper published a very different headline. Babe Ruth headed towards New Brunswick. Back then, that second headline might have been less surprising to readers than the first. Even as he was at the height of his global fame, Babe Ruth was a remarkably regular visitor to both New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. In fact, this trip was actually a second visit to New Brunswick that year alone. He'd already come to Fredericton back in February. He was clearly not very used to Canadian winters though, because he was photographed in Fredericton wearing a preposterously large fur coat. This trip was different though. It was unusually secretive, which is highly irregular, because on his other maritime trips, Babe Ruth would spend hours signing whatever anyone asked him to. In fact, sometimes he would even deliberately seek out fans for himself. In Robert Ashe's book called Even the Babe Came to Play, he recounted one time Babe Ruth was driving through Nova Scotia's South Shore, and he spotted some kids playing baseball, and he stopped to say hello, hit a home run for them, and signed some autographs. Babe Ruth saw that one little boy was hanging back. He was too shy to ask the global superstar for his autograph. Babe Ruth noticed the boy, and he signed a baseball, and he tossed it to him. Then he signed another baseball and tossed that one to the boy too, asking him to promise him that he would sell it for as much money as he could get. This 1925 trip was different from that though, conducted in complete secrecy and deliberately avoiding people. This was a remarkable task though, because he was traveling with some of the biggest sports names of his time. On October 9th, the Telegraph Journal newspaper caught wind of the trip and reported the list of concerned friends who Babe Ruth was traveling with. Eddie Collins, manager of the Chicago White Sox, Muddy Rule, the greatest catcher in baseball, Bob Shockey, veteran pitcher of the Yankees, who is the organizer of the expedition, Joe Bush, who starred with the St. Louis Browns, Benny Bengo, the Yankees' leading catcher, and with Bob Boyd, the New York baseball writer. For two weeks after arriving in New Brunswick, the group's whereabouts in the province were a mystery. But then on Halloween day, just as the region was being walloped by unprecedented early snowstorms, a reporter from Fredericton's Daily Gleaner newspaper managed to track them down at a lodge in Nipisiguit. The reporter found that seven of the eight men, this included their guide, were friendly and willing to chat with them but that the person they most wanted to speak to, Babe Ruth, couldn't be spotted. The reporter chatted amicably with the stars about hunting in New Brunswick. Apparently, their trip had been going very well up until the storm left them up to their waists in snow. The reporter brought up baseball, but was swiftly cut off by Muddy Rule, who declared, We didn't talk about baseball when we went into the woods. We went in there to forget about baseball. The reporter then spotted Babe Ruth, the back of the log cabin, glaring at them. The reporter remarked that he looked like a different man than when he went into the woods. When he said that though, Eddie Collins agreed, mentioning that when they arrived due to the poor roads they had to walk to their lodge. He said that Babe Ruth was unable to manage the walk at that point and he had to ride a horse up to the lodge instead. But then Collins told the reporter, there's no doubt this trip has done Babe a lot of good. It has got the big fellow sorted on the right road to regaining his good health. He's stronger and better than when he went into the woods. And Muddy Rule chimed in. This is the greatest kind of tonic anybody ever tried. The sports stars told the reporter the snow had ruined their trip and they were going home. Before departing, the reporter took a photo of them all. It shows a group of men standing in this freakishly early Halloween snowstorm, smiling and looking relaxed, all except for one, a hulking large man in the center of the group who glares at the camera. That was Babe Ruth. The reporter, fully aware that they had a huge scoop on their hands, made his way through the snowstorm out of the woods to submit a story. It was immediately republished all over the world and read by 
Babe Ruth's millions and millions of fans. By the time people began to flock to the cabin to see the sports stars, they were already gone. But not back to America. They disappeared even deeper into the backwoods of New Brunswick. For the next two weeks, nobody heard a word from this group which boasted some of the most famous sports stars of their time, including the most photographed man in the world. It's not entirely clear where this group went, although on, on past trips, Babe Ruth favored the Tobique and the Miramichi region, so that might be a hint to where they went, but we just don't know what they did during that time. It would be two weeks after that reporter for the Gleaner told the world of their whereabouts when, on November 14th, a reporter from the Moncton Transcript newspaper was standing on the departure platform of the Moncton train station saying goodbye to a friend when, through the crowd, they spotted a familiar face. Babe Ruth. The astonished reporter headed towards the global superstar who was standing on the platform with a local guide named George Crossman, and the reporter noted that The whole trip is cloaked in mystery. The reporter approached Babe Ruth, but immediately made the mistake of suggesting there might be something of interest in his trip. This was definitely not the right thing for the reporter to say about a trip whose purpose Babe Ruth was definitely trying to keep a secret. He immediately lost his temper and began shouting at the reporter. The reporter protested that they'd only meant to ask about what they thought was a hunting trip, and all he really wanted to know was whether Babe Ruth managed to shoot a bear. This only further agitated Babe Ruth, though, who shouted the I would wrestle a bear to death with my bare hands right then and there if one appeared. Babe Ruth then stormed off towards his waiting train, and then he paused, realizing what the reporter's inevitable next move would be. He turned and he told his guide, Monctonian George Crossman, that If you kept quiet, I'll return next year and hire you again. The reporter glumly concluded his article by writing Mr. Crossman is keeping quiet. By the time the next baseball season began, Babe Ruth had lost 45 pounds. He went on to have a record-breaking year. His off-field antics dwindled, and he appeared to have returned to his jovial old self. Far from being fired by the Yankees, he would continue playing baseball for more than a decade. And he would return to the Maritimes dozens of times. That was Backyard History with your host, Andrew McLean. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for another hidden story that happened in your own backyard. Produced by Jordan Lozier.